Good evening to everyone and welcome to Gene Explain web seminar today. Our topic of today is Transfac and its applications. And um, it is my very pleasure to present, uh, to, to invite presenters of today, Professor Edgar Wingender and Dr. Volker Matis. Both names might be familiar for you uh, from the multiple publications by Transfac team. Professor Wingender is the founder of the Transfac database and working on this database more than 30 years now. Dr. Volker is involved in all aspects of Transfac more than uh, 20 years now, starting from data collection through all the steps of creating positional weight matrices, testing tools, testing databases, releases, uh, trainings on databases and support. With this, I'm happy to invite Professor Wingender to start his presentation. Thank you very much, Olga. So as Olga kindly introduced already, uh, it is now more than 30 years, more like 32 years ago, that I started with the first uh, work on what turned on to be later our Transfac database. At that time, it was a pure data collection, first of all, and I would like to uh, make you familiar with uh, some of these original concepts that then uh, led us to develop a real database out of a first data collection. And after uh, my introductory remarks, then uh, Volker will take over and will guide you through the database, how it looks like today and what uh, functions are associated with that today. Some of you have already uh, seen some nice pictures of uh, the city of Wolfenbüttel where our company is located. Um, it is approximately here between Hanover and Berlin in the northern part of Germany. It's a nice and picturesque uh, old city, historical city, where we uh, like to work and uh, to live, of course. It is here and in a nearby research institute where I uh, started collecting data about um, components that are involved in uh, transcription regulation, transcription regulating proteins. The word transcription factors at that time was a little bit restricted to what we call today general uh, transcription factors. Those of you who have attended my previous lecture about transcription factor and their classification may remember there are, uh, there is quite a number of general transcription factors that assemble with uh, the RNA polymerase at the transcription start site. At that time, uh, we just were aware that there are lots of other transcription regulating proteins that bind to DNA. Most of them or are bound to DNA bound complexes through protein-protein interactions. And at that time, actually, it was uh, triggered by some remarks of colleagues, whether there is any compilation of all these many transcription factors that are out there at that time. It was about 100 across all eukaryotic uh, cells. Uh, actually, I started to make such a collection uh, based on a couple of reviews that I had written before that. And as you can see, this was uh, published in Nucleic Acid Research in, uh, in 1988. One of the tables that were uh, printed at that time in facsimile, uh, I collected these data there on my old Atari computer. Uh, so <laughs> it's not really state of today's art, uh, the kind of printout, but what you can clearly see, it's uh, simply a table of genes that were alphabetically ordered, that were uh, belonging to the genomes of certain species. And to each of these genes, usually slightly upstream of the transcription start site, uh, in these positions, they were, there was um, binding activity identified by some conventional methods that have an abbreviation here. Uh, 3 and 4B are some uh, well-known uh, um, uh, conventional methods. 3 stands for gel retardation or gel shift assays. 1A, for instance, for DNA's footprinting. Uh, and then uh, by applying these methods, um, the binding site was delimited to these positions 
positions minus means upstream of the transcription start site. That here in this column, we just had, had uh, uh, in the display the uh, sequence of this binding site and the name of the transcription factor binding to this site. Uh, well, these factors at that time usually were very ill-defined and at that time uh, were hardly more than just a binding activity that was identified in a crude cellular or nuclear extract, nothing else. So, but what, what was about these factors and uh, of course, uh, each of these factors bound to several binding sites. Therefore, it didn't make sense to put the features of these factors in the same column. And uh, instead, we built a second table that now gave further explanations about these factors alphabetically ordered, identified in these species, binding to these genes as specified in the other table. And then a few features of these um, binding activities um, like the molecular weight, whether there was a zinc finger structure, uh, synonyms, and at the end, of course, uh, these are code numbers for the references where we have taken out all these data from. So what we were starting with were these two tables about transcription factor binding sites and transcription factors. And uh, well, I stay with that for a moment. Um, as uh, some, some people have uh, pointed out earlier, each database uh, model is a model of some real world domain. And what uh, we did in that, that time, we noticed there are these two fundamental entities uh, involved in transcription regulations in these two tables, simply printed tables originally, which we then simply transformed into two tables in a relational database system uh, linked by a many-to-many -many or end-to-m relation because each transcription factor binds more than just to one binding site in a genome. And interestingly, each transcription factor binding site usually can interact with more than just transcription one transcription factor. There are usually a couple of uh, isoforms that have nearly identical DNA binding domains but differ slightly in their biological effects but there are even more complex uh, events that may happen there. Uh, slightly later in 1991 we had another publication at a genome conference in, in Germany uh, and here, that was the first time that the name Transfac actually popped up in the public. Uh, that was the way how we presented one single entry from the database, uh, which re uh, depicts one particular binding site uh, in the human, in a human gene. Uh, and here you see the positions of the, the binding site and the sequence of the site uh, and so on. Slightly later, it looked like this, and this is now already the computationally clean uh, way of uh, database printout. Uh, we uh, had organized that in, in the way that was put as a general standard for molecular biology databases at that time. That means each database that is used in bioscience should not just be readable by a computer, but also should be readable by a human reader. So there should be a textual format of each database entry. That was the way how uh, GenBank, Emble Database and Uniprot organized their uh, database entries at that time. So this is one example of one transcription factor entry. Here's the accession number, the name, uh, synonyms, the species where it was uh, uh, obtained from, um, the gene of that uh, transcription factor, uh, then its position in the transcription factor classification I had outlined last time, and then quite a number of structural features in plain text, but all these statements uh, link to a certain reference. Um, uh, a number of functional features were given in the same entry and then quite a number of uh, other transcription factors were mentioned including their linked accession numbers where it was shown that this transcription factor is physically interacting with. 
In this case, it was the entry of C Jun transcription factor, AP1. We had 67 interacting transcription factors. Further down, there are links to altogether 12 positional weight matrices. I come to this uh, particular data type a little bit later. And 246 individual transcription factor binding sites in different, um, in that case, mammalian genomes. Further down, we had a number of uh, database cross-links to uh, our TransPath database, uh, where we have here uh, one pathway, <clears throat> in that case, that uh, involves this uh, human protein. We have all together links to 11 composite elements. I come to that later as well. And to external database like Uniprot or, the, or PDB. And uh, all this information was obtained from 134 references. All of them were manually uh, evaluated and extracted for putting together such a database entry. By the way, this is the format of the database, of the factor table of the Transfac database that still is available on the quite uh, uh, up-to-date uh, version under this URL here. You can go there, search for factors and get the information in this old fashioned, but still very instructive and workable format. Free of uh, charge and without any barriers. So not even registration is required for that. Quite early in our publication from 1991, we developed the idea to come up with a uh, comprehensive library of binding site models that could be used not just for describing what the individual transcription factor preferably is binding to, but also to use that as a method to uh, identify and predict potential binding sites in genomic sequences. This is what we found when we compiled all together 41 SP1 binding sites for the transcription fact SP1 that were known at that uh, early time already. And here in the center, you see the general consensus of SP1 binding GGGCGG. And what becomes immediately obvious when you extend that uh, to the, the flanks and what you see here is just the number of ACGT in the aligned binding sites and their surroundings in the individual positions. Uh, then you see that there is a clear predominance of G's and C's also in the flanking regions of that uh, here as well. And we know today, it's uh, quite common, even textbook knowledge, that SP1 sites appear as clusters usually. So what we see here are uh, additional SP1 sites in the flanks. Uh, they don't give rise to such clean consensus sequence because the distance can vary sometimes. And that was not taken into consideration here because we focus just on the core site in that case. So. Going back to our developing database model, we had these two tables in the very beginning. We, uh, whenever we had five or more individual transcription factor binding sites for one transcription factor, we did this alignment, constructed such a uh, uh, positional weight matrix by simply counting after proper alignment. And it didn't matter which kind of alignment uh, algorithm you used for these short sequences. We counted how many ACGT you have in each column of this uh, alignment and then uh, constructed a matrix for a particular transcription factor. So at the end, we came up with a considerable library of such matrices. Um, and of course, each binding site goes usually into one matrix. So that's the one to, uh, one to many relationship. Uh, but here we have a many to many relationship again between factors and matrices because one matrix can simultaneously uh, work for several isoforms of transcription factors. And on the other side, each transcription factor can have more than just matrix, uh, one matrix. We know many cases where transcription factors have several DNA binding domains with several preferences, uh, DNA binding preferences. So they need several matrices to uh, model their binding capabilities completely.
So all together, the uh, abstracted model of the transfer system looks like that. We have the factors, we have the binding sites, we have the site models as an abstraction on top of the binding sites. And on top of the factors, we have another abstraction, which is the transcription factor classification that we have uh, discussed in our previous lecture. Few statistics, that's how uh, the, the uh, um, content looks like these days. Sorry, I was a little bit ahead of time. It is 2020 here, not 2030. Uh, so we have, uh, in the meantime, detailed information about nearly 50,000 eukaryotic transcription factors, more than 118,000 binding sites, 143 factor site links, and uh, amongst the, the genes, we have more than 100,000 genes where we have regulatory elements uh, characterized in the literature. Uh, altogether, we have nearly 10,000 transcription factor binding uh, matrices here, and all this information came from more than 40,000 manually evaluated um, references. Interestingly, of course, and uh, referring to more modern methodologies than something like DNA's one footprinting are these chip seek or chip-chip uh, chip, uh, uh, experiments that uh, give us in their, in these high throughput approaches, a huge number of potential of uh, proven binding sites, 87 million transcription factor binding sites is what we collected in that table for the, uh, these uh, high throughput data and other genomic locations like uh, uh, DNA's hypersensitive sites or uh, histone modifications and so on. And we have collected 16 million uh, binding sites. In addition to the uh, transfer core contents, we uh, have a section we call TransPro because it's a collection of promoter sequences. And as you can see, it's quite uh, a certain number of uh, not just human, but uh, other model organisms where we have <clears throat> computationally and uh, based on experimental validation, put together these promoter sequences uh, around the transcription start site that are now available and immediately directly for further analysis. All together we have uh, here uh, the promoters and alternative promoters, sorry, for of about 12, uh, of exactly 12 genomes, among them seven mammalian and three plant genomes. Anyway, all of them eukaryotic. So uh, Transwag was already out there for some time and a couple of tools were making use of the position weight matrices. We decided to implement some of our own ideas and Alexander Kell and his team then came up with the match tool which is now an integral part of the transfer database, which can be applied and used for searching potential transcription factor binding sites in DNA sequences. Just to show you, there is a certain uh, algorithm behind, behind <coughs> some mathematical abracadabra. We will go to that in more detail in another lecture, in a more specialized lecture about how to uh, identify transcription factor binding sites and their combinations. So shortly after we uh, had built the transcript uh, transfer database, uh, we came up with the idea of uh, putting together information of uh, uh, combinations of transcription factor sites uh, that have a particular biological function. And that was put together in the COMPEL database. And the ideas of that and the first version were mainly developed by our colleagues and friends in uh, Novosibirsk in the group of Ada Ramashenko and uh, Nikolai Kolchanov. So Olga, Kel Magulis, who kindly introduced our today's uh, webinar, was the uh, key person who had developed the, this uh, module. It's now a module of Transwork, we call it TransCompel. And just to show you what does it mean, composite elements are combinations of individual transcription factor binding sites, where we know that the binding factors are in physical and functional 
uh, interaction with each other. Uh, usually they exert a synergistic, occasionally antagonistic effect. And one of the best studied uh, composite elements that you find in many, many promoters is the uh, um, composite element of SP1 and NFY binding site. And there are more complex uh, uh, composite elements and modules like this very well studied one from the uh, human beta, inter uh, uh, beta interferon uh, enhancer, an enhancer where we have binding sites for AP1, an HMG protein, NF kappa B and uh, interferon regulatory factor IRF. This is information that we are also storing in, in uh, this uh, special appendix module of uh, today's Transfax system. So I'm nearly at the end and before I hand over to uh, Volker, I would like to show you a few perspectives in which direction we want to uh, expand our database. Uh, altogether, it shall be considered in the future as the general resource that explains syntax and semantics of gene regulation. What do we mean with that? Well, uh, the syntax is simply uh, the, the answer to the question, which combination of gene regulatory words, short sequences in the promoter makes sense. As in the natural language, not any combination of words gives a meaningful sentence. The same here, uh, what kind of combination of regulatory features give, constitutes a meaningful sentence that describes the regulatory features of a certain gene. These may comprise individual binding sites or composite elements like this one here, AP1 NFAT, which is also very well known and well studied, also computationally well characterized composite elements that you find in numerous promoters and enhancers. So we are going to enrich the transfer systematically by uh, promoter structures in terms of combination of binding sites. We want to store these composite modules uh, by expanding the transcompel database and then add additional characteristics of these regulatory interactions. Uh, of course, we have to increasingly consider then the high throughput data and thoroughly uh, extract the, uh, uh, the meaning of uh, this very rich treasure of information we have at hand today. So, uh, as for the semantics, we would like to go more for the functional features by constructing gene regulatory networks, by learning and predicting whether certain transcription factors and their combinations are have an activating or repressing function, which is actually very hard to predict just from sequence features. We want to identify network modules in these regulatory networks that uh, we may associate with certain biological functions. And finally, uh, add additional characteristics of these regulatory interactions. Uh, and uh, that will be then uh, something new in our database that we will put there in the future. So one of the uh, functions is of course, to uh, react and to respond to external signals. That was one of the early ideas that uh, we had together with collecting these binding sites because uh, it was quite early already obvious that some of these binding factors are uh, regulated in response to signaling pathways. Uh, and this is something that we systematically collected later in our TransPass database that will be subject again of another uh, um, a webinar. And at the end, I uh, said already, we are going to construct uh, transcriptional networks because transcription factors, of course, as proteins are encoded themselves by genes. And these genes are also uh, under the regulation of transcription factors. And that all constitutes a nice transcriptional core network when we just move among the uh, uh, the transcription factors and their own genes, uh, which can be expanded then to all kinds of target genes, of course. Uh, to make these kind of networks 
then systematically and associate with biological functions will be one of the future tasks. And with that, I would like uh, to stop here and hand over to Volker, who will uh, guide you now through the database and show you some of the most important features. So, thank you. So, hello, everybody. So, uh, I want to start. So, this is uh, the transfer interface as you see it when you open it the first time. And um, uh, you can add here um, or um, uh, unfold this uh, part to get um, to additional um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, search, search features. So you can specify what you want to search for and in uh, what organism. So I want to start searching for a transcription factor and I can uh, specify here so we um, yeah, there is a selection of some organisms which you can specify or you can search uh, via all. Let's uh, select human and um, I take as an example HIF1, so hypoxia induced factor. Um, and I get here in the lower part uh, the result. And I can then, uh, so I can of course open the entry of this transcription factor and have a closer look. So this is the, the more modern looking way. Um, as you can see the, the entry here. In, and here is a little um, table of contents. Uh, you can see it has uh, lots of uh, various sections. Uh, with uh, very uh, different data types. Uh, if you want to go directly to the um, transfer core data, then you can jump here to transcription regulation. And um, the first there's a section on how this gene is regulated. So the HIF1 gene itself. And, um, but if it's a transcription factor, there's also a section on the regulation of gene expression by this factor. So there's a general information from uh, based on this uh, TF class, which um, Edgar uh, uh, told about last uh, in the last webinar, uh, web seminar. And um, below you can find then uh, details on uh, target genes and the binding sites, as well as um, yeah, so some some other information. So, but um, I want to show you some more um, what you can do with the search interface uh, interface actually. So when you have a result here, a transcription factor, you can then uh, process the search further. So you can for, could for some search for interacting factors. I mean, you, if you just have one single factor, you can also look this up in the locus report, but um, if uh, you may have a number of factors, then it uh, makes sense to um, use the search engine for that. So you can look here, for example, the, we get the R, A, R, and T um, factor, so which um, heterodimerizes with HIF1, um, but there are also some other uh, independent transcription factors which um, can form larger complexes with the HIF1. And we can also look for, <coughs> sorry, for uh, factors, uh, for genes bound by factors. So for those genes for which we um, collected from the literature, uh, proof transcription factor binding sites. So this is not, not yet a, a binding site prediction. And then in another tab, I, we are getting a list of um, those genes, so target genes for this, um, factor. I want to um, open one of these um, an entry of one of these target genes. So basically it uh, looks uh, on the first look it looks similar uh, some some differences. I can also jump to the transcriptional regulation part. So in this case because it's um, 
fact, uh, a gene which does not um, encode for a transcription factor itself. So in this case, we have only the section on uh, how this gene is regulated and not a section on uh, regulation by this gene. And um, so here we are getting listed um, the binding sites or the interactions between um, a number of factors and uh, the sequences, uh, the binding sequences in the uh, gene. And in some cases only, um, so depending on the experimental data which we find in the literature, um, so in some cases this is only, uh, only the DNA binding has been shown. In other cases also um, an activating or repressing effect of the transcription factor on the regulation of this gene uh, was shown. When I uh, open this, uh, one of these um, binding site entries, so this is um, the, the very core data uh, in TransFAC. Um, and uh, you can see here, so in um, capital letters, um, the, um, yeah, the core sequence, uh, which is um, interacting with the uh, transcription factor. And um, here you can see the experimental data uh, provided in the references here below. Yeah, yeah you can see 21 uh, references were published on this uh, single binding site. And um, yeah, and uh, in this case, it's interacting with this uh, HIF1 um, heterodimer. And we also have, um, what was uh, mentioned in the first part by Edgar. So we have these composite elements. So there, uh, the, the, peep, uh, the, the authors of the paper, they did not only show um, that the factor was interacting with the binding site and uh, if it has an activating or repressing effect, but they also showed effects of uh, two factors in combination. So here you can see, for example, that HNF4 and uh, QTF that they have an antagonistic effect so that they um, actually compete for the same binding site and HNF4 which is a um, um, I can open one of these entries um, HNF4 uh, can then uh, have a synergy or has a synergistic effect uh, in combination with uh, HIF1 and so we get here a combination of um, uh, a tissue restricted factor, the HNF4, so which is uh, found mainly in liver and kidney, and uh, this uh, HIF1, which, uh, uh, which brings in this uh, high, um, uh, regulation of uh, high hypoxia. So here you find then in this composite element report, which uh, um, similar data as in the binding site report, but um, at, yeah, with additional evidences on, on this uh, interaction of two factors. So just to say, uh, uh, there are, uh, depending on uh, different uh, data types, so I've uh, shown these uh, interacting factors. So in that case, the, uh, uh, so the, it's purely based on interaction between two factors, so physical interaction of two factors, and here in the composite element where the two factors have an uh, synergistic um, or, or antagonistic effect on each other, uh, on, on the regulation of the gene. And we, um, so you can find this, uh, this information um, combined in this, uh, in the locus reports or for the gene and the transcription factor. Um, but we also mapped uh, these uh, binding sites to the um, genomic sequence. And we display this information, um, particularly in the promoter report. So I opened already a, a one, uh, this promoter report for this Apple gene. And uh, because it takes, takes a little while until all the data is uh, loaded and also um, there is a pre-selection by default, uh, some of the features here, uh, which we provide in the promoter report are pre-selected uh, and I 
uh, wanted to switch most of them off to focus on um, what I want to uh, show you here. So um, uh, the, the region which we provide in the Pomodoro report is uh, from minus uh, 10,000 to plus 1,000 relative uh, to this uh, transcription start site. And uh, here the gray bars, which you see that's um, uh, fast cons intervals, uh, so conserved regions. And here in this area, you find a number of uh, transcription factor binding sites um, collected from literature, uh, which could be mapped to this um, area here. And we can also, so these are the indi individual binding sites. And just to mention, I think um, there was um, yeah, this, I saw already this one question um, in the, and uh, this was about number of binding sites. So these individual binding sites um, collected from literature. So we have uh, for transcription factors about uh, 30,000 entries from, um, for human. And, um, and if, uh, in addition, about the same number for microRNA target sequences. Um, but in addition, we have these uh, high throughput data for chip intervals, and uh, these, are, of course, they exceed um, this number uh, far. And we also map these um, high throughput data, the chip uh, intervals, onto the promoter regions. And I show you so okay, you, so you can see it overlaps here so roughly in a region from in this case from minus one, uh, 1000 to plus 1000 um, so which you could regard uh, basically as the core promoter roughly and though there may be also some upstream and downstream uh, regions which are also important for the uh, regulation of the gene expression um, so just to sh uh, show you that um, where these data are located and uh, uh, just to mention that um, we, uh, so these transcription start sites, uh, they are taken from ensemble, but we cluster them and uh, then um, we get a, uh, yeah, a lower number of uh, put uh, yeah, potential uh, promoters for a gene. And uh, we, we have shown that uh, these, um, yeah, or we defined and uh, best support promoter, and then there are also alternative promoters as well. So um, if you want to get uh, for a particular transcription factor or these uh, chip data, um, then you can either browse, there is a browse list for all these. Um, um, chip seek and uh, similar analysis, or you can also go to the respective um, to the, uh, the respective um, factor entry. And uh, no, just okay. I opened this already. This um, HIF one, if you remember, that was the first which I opened. And um, when you go further down here, you also get listed all these uh, chip experiment reports for the chip data. Uh, so these chip data, they are derived from GEO and, uh, and some other sources. Some are also taken directly from the, from the reference. And in the case of this uh, HIF1, so you can see that um, the, which the, the different cell, <coughs> cell lines, the data were uh, derived from. And uh, in this case, also, um, if it was induced, so hypoxia induced, so for example, uric with hypoxia, um, uh, treated cells, because we have here this HIF1 um, gene. And um, here you can see how this um, uh, chip experiment report looks like. So first, some uh, general information, and then uh, so these uh, binding fragments or intervals, so typically there are 200 uh, or 300 nucleotides in length. And um, in, in many cases so where we had, have uh, already a, a transcription factor a binding matrix for the respective factor, we scanned the sequences and uh, annotated the sequences with um, or the intervals with the, this uh, best scoring site for the factor. 
So you can download uh, either the complete fragments in FASE or uh, PED format, or you can download the, this um, best scoring site in uh, FASTE or PED format. And you can also uh, download uh, lists of um, genes in the vicinity, also overlapping with these um, intervals. So you can uh, specify uh, with what uh, distance range you want to take into account. So this is um, so far um, on this uh, factor. And I want to go to um, yeah, do another search. And uh, I want to search now for a gene. I need, okay, I need to switch now to genes and protein search. Because this is not a transcription factor. And uh, so uh, in this case, I want to show now um, uh, binding site prediction. So we have certain tools in the um, uh, combined with, uh, with TransFact. So you can also directly go to the interface here, or you can submit uh, the gene to the tool for analysis. So I am selecting a human mouse red. And yeah, I can now, uh, I leave all the um, default parameters and do we um, just rough. So uh, various of these tools go via this taskbar. So that's what you just saw. And then you see the result. So the match analysis, um, I, I don't want to uh, yeah, go into detail how this um, works. Um, as Edgar mentioned in a later uh, web seminar, uh, there will be uh, a later web seminar uh, with in-depth information on uh, binding site search. But here just how um, this result looks like, what you get. So you have here the three main sections, an analysis summary, a matrix summary listing the uh, position and weight matrices which uh, were used in the analysis, and for which uh, binding sites were found in the anal analyzed promoters or sequences. And here below the uh, promoter sequences, which were extracted um, uh, from the system and uh, analyzed for binding sites. So I uh, analyzed here in parallel a red human uh, mouse. So this um, uh, sometimes this can make sense when you are interested in a particular gene to also have a look on uh, orthologous uh, on the result in orthologous uh, promoters. And uh, you can also um, yeah, zoom in when I click on this one, yeah, on this promoter, then I'm uh, zoom, uh, zoomed in and I can also here for human and mouse, um, we have these fast cons intervals, which I also already showed in the promoter report. Uh, they are also available in the match result and can be used to filter uh, the match analysis result for conserved regions. So it, this leaves you now only uh, predicted binding sites which are over overlap with the conserved regions. And just to mention, there is another feature here. So um, uh, binding sites, um, in analyzed promoters for which uh, there is also experimental evidence. Uh, so ne not necessarily in this exact position, but for which it has been shown that uh, smart factors can actually bind um, to um, and regulate this VEGF8 um, genes. And then it's marked here with an E for this experimental data. So it's a basically a cross-reference, which uh, makes it uh, easy for the user to um, immediately show, see um, if there is already experimental data available on some of these uh, predictions. And uh, you can have various export options here in the 
results so you can export the data in various format. Uh, if you submitted a list of genes or um, intervals, so you can also submit intervals, then uh, you can uh, also export the information in form of uh, BD intervals and um, then uh, upload them into a genome browser. So that's uh, to this part. So uh, yeah, just to mention, so as I showed, um, for a normal match analysis, uh, when you just analyze uh, the promoter of a selected gene, um, it uh, uh, can often make sense to try to combine this um, analysis with uh, some additional filtering, like here with uh, uh, using the, the fast cons intervals or something similar. And now I want to, um, yeah, so I can um, not only search for single genes or factors or um, some other information, I can also upload uh, low, whole lists of genes. So for example, from an experiment, So these uh, were uh, these are genes which were upregulated um, uh, by under certain conditions. So, um, so in this case, actually, there was a, um, also some quantitative uh, values. I ignored this. I don't need this at the moment, but I could also upload this uh, together. Um, and just to show you that uh, there are. Um, so I showed you that here is, um, is this option for doing a search within result. So when you have a result, then do a, a second search on a, a, the result of a first search. Uh, you can save a result, then it uh, will appear here in this uh, My Data tree. You can export this list. Uh, there are two, depending on uh, what result you have, there are two uh, types of exports. One is uh, a one-to-one -one export. So that's what you see is also what you can export. But in case you have um, a gene list, a pure gene list, you have the option to include in the export uh, certain external identifiers and also certain annotations here. You can also uh, submit uh, one or more of these uh, genes to the Pathfinder. So that's a tool for um, uh, pathway visualization. So although uh, Transfac is not a pathway database, but um, uh, it contains a subset of uh, pathway data for the uh, creating um, gene regulatory networks. Um, and you can map uh, uploaded genes onto various ontologies. These are also not uh, uh, transfer core data, uh, but they are data from uh, databases which are um, optionally integrated with uh, uh, transfer. And um, so first the uh, whole hierarchies are getting uploaded and now it's mapped uh, down to these uh, 91 uh, genes, which I uh, yeah, uploaded before. Uh, this is just mapping the genes. And there is also a tool where I then for identify shared attributes, uh, where it's also doing a mapping, but in that case, it's also um, yeah, it's, uh, calculating a p-value for the enrichment of uh, certain terms or characteristics. So just to show that. So these are, uh, as I said, these are not the transfer core data, but you uh, can still use them for uh, compl getting compl uh, complementary information uh, to put uh, on the analysis of your uh, genes. So uh, I showed you the normal binding site prediction with the match tool. I uh, just want to mention there are um, a number of other tools. For example, there is a tool for uh, de novo motive search and then you can uh, based on this de novo motive, 
a matrix is created and this matrix can be compared against the matrices in the system. And, and there is a tool for, um, or for uh, containing workflows for an enrichment analysis. So for analyzing a set of uh, co-regulated genes for enriched uh, transcription factor binding sites. And just increase that. So uh, the, the workflows depend on, uh, on the type of data which you have if you want to submit a gene list. And then you, it's, this could be up or down regulated genes for microarray or RNA seq data. And you can do this uh, first work. We use the first workflow. If you have a list of um, sequences or intervals um, that could be from ChIP-seq or ATTAC-seq um, uh, analysis, then you could do the second. Uh, for a list of transcripts, you can either use the first. Um, um, workflow in that case uh, the transcripts are getting mapped onto genes and then you uh, work further with the promoter sequences which we provide in the system for these particular genes or you could see leave the transcript separately um, analyzing the, yeah, this one so uh, uh, yeah <clears throat> I just want to show you at the end um, one of these um, analysis of these enrichment um, match, yeah. so this um, goes actually is uh, quite uh, fast so it depends of course how many sequences you include but if you have a reason num a reasonable number of uh, genes in the foreground and background set uh, then it goes uh, quite fast but i already did that uh, task part before. So I analyzed here 91 genes against here 612 from the background. Uh, in basically it looks similar like a match result. Um, the, the differences here as you see in the analysis summary um, result for the experimental data set and the background data set and uh, where you had for the normal match only one, um, yeah, one group. And here you get uh, the matrices listed where you have the enrichment and uh, you can, yeah, some hidden columns which you can include um, and then look for those uh, with, with a good enrichment as well as a good uh, p-value for the enrichment. Uh, just to say, so here below you have the, in the result for the individual sequences when you select one matrix here then the result here below get it gets updated automatically so it leaves only uh, the result for those hits um, uh, yeah hits for this matrix which i selected to above i can also filter there are also various ways uh, to filter the result um, yeah, by data so uh, i could then look for those um, promoters, analyze promoters for which I get a uh, uh, hit for this matrix. So this is just giving you a rough overview on uh, what you can do and uh, just to say that there are um, uh, yeah. additional tools um, are available in this uh, Gene Explain platform. So there are um, many more tools and uh, where you can do a more um, yeah, yeah. complete analysis, not only for the binding site search, um, but an overall analysis of RNA-seq and other data sets, uh, also of uh, genomic intervals and, um, um, and so on. Thank you for listening. And I give, give back to Olga. Yeah, thank you very much, Folke. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wingender, for your nice presentations. And now we would like to look through a couple of questions. We start with this question uh, about the possible list of transcription factors and respective binding sites for mouse brain area. 
Uh, maybe with this question we have a chance to demonstrate ontology search and show this search by multiple parameters like mouse transcription factors expressed in brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, I showed you that you can um, upload the list of genes and then uh, map these genes uh, to the ontology. But you can also load the ontology uh, hierarchies uh, separately, and then you can search, for example, brain search. Okay, so this, uh, first of all, you can see always here this uh, two letter code uh, starting, so that's uh, from the uh, which um, uh, to which. Um, ontology this refers to. So um, biological property, for example, and then we have the um, disease, uh, so the you know, disease information. So we include also some disease inter um, combinations here, particularly for the, um, for the transcription factor. So this is a subset of this uh, human PSD data from our the connected option database. Okay, here we have expression in brain. And then I can search. So it, it takes a bit. So the, the number of uh, data uh, are relatively big, which are available in, this, uh, in the ontology search. So therefore, Yeah, it takes, uh, <clears throat> it can take a while until. Okay, we can wait and yeah. important that we have shown there is ontology yeah. search where su such a complex yeah. searches can be applied and data can be found. Mm -hmm. Even maybe uh, we can try to answer so far another question. What is the matrix score and matrix um, overall score and core, score of the core? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this score. So um, uh, on one of the slides, um, Ed, Edgar showed um, the, um, uh, how the score is calculated, uh, if you remember with the sum function and so on. And um, uh, so this is uh, calculated for the, uh, so yeah, for both for the overall uh, matrix length, as well as for the core. And the core, uh, we define that for, uh, by the five consecu consecutive most um, conserved nucleotides in the uh, matrix. So it's a, it's a little bit, so the core is not adapted um, to the uh, properties of a, a specific factor. So it's always five. So it, you could, could argue that uh, in some cases, so it's not the natural uh, core of the factor. It's, just in, uh, 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 what do you say, not, yeah, so it's an estimation of the, it's not uh, taking the spe uh, specifics of the different factors into account. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Volker. Uh, such a question on uh, how many transcription factors do we have? In like um, okay, the transcription factors. So, usually, so in, in, in to, I mean, for a particular organism like human, um, in, in general, uh, one sa uh, says that there are up to 2000 transcription factor genes. And um, so, I think we have maybe 80, 80 90 percent of um, the, these factors. Mm -hmm. Though we don't necessarily have for all of them a positional weight matrix. Plus there are entries for transcription factor complexes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Like AP1 that come yeah. on top. Yeah. And uh, uh, altogether, we have, uh, as I have shown in the statistics, about uh, 50,000 eukaryotic transcription factors. Yeah. 
but that goes through all kinds of uh, eukaryotic realms, but uh, uh, mostly they are from mammalian species. And I have seen there was a question specifically for human factors and binding sites um, that, that can be answered, uh, but you should consider that experimentally, in many cases, people used mixed systems, at mm -hmm. least when it was for in vitro characterizations, they checked how a human factor that was cloned and available for them binds to a mouse promoter and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Moreover, this differentiation for the factor side at least is of limited value because their DNA binding domains are extremely conserved amongst the mammalian species at least. They are practically identical when you make a sequence alignment for the DNA binding domains. Well noticed. Right. So um, their binding specificities are in any way uh, the same. So when you make a prediction you don't have necessarily to uh, 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 pay attention on whether you make the prediction based on a matrix for a human or a mouse factor, they are alike. Of course, when we have a look at the transcription factor binding sites, the proven ones, in the mouse promoter of gene A or the human promoter in gene A, they may uh, considerably vary. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, maybe we would like to comment about this. Approximate percentage of binding sites with activation repression data. Of course, we cannot give exact <laughs> percentage, but maybe comments on activation repression data. So I understood the question that uh, in the way, how many binding sites do we have where we have functional implication at all, whether it's activation or repression doesn't matter, uh, first of all. And uh, I did not comment on that. We have a specific uh, qualifier in our binding site characterization in the Transact database. And uh, the highest category is that it has been shown that this pure factor really binds to that side and that this binding has a functional implication. It then gets the quality one, which is the highest quality of a binding site. So binding of pure factor proven experimentally and um, shown that it has a functional implication. We could check that. I don't have the exact figure in, in, in my mind, but that could be checked easily. Uh, how many binding sites of quality one we do have. I would uh, guess that it is maybe about 20% of all of them. Of course, there are also more indirect functional implications for the others, um, for some, some additional indirect evidences. Uh, uh, so, Practically, uh, I would say that uh, nearly uh, all of these conventionally identified binding sites have a functional implication. To, sh to say whether it is an activation or a repression in the individual case, that, that's very hard to say. Um, since sometimes the same interaction may work as an activation in the one and uh, as a repression uh, in, in another biological context. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Edgar. I think it's very informative. And another question, is the distance, distance between transcription factor binding site and the transcript start site usually conserved? Uh, well, that's a, it's a good question. No, um, not necessarily, no. There are a couple of factors like Tata binding protein or NFY factors uh, that have a more or less fixed distance of 30 or 80 base pairs in most of the cases to the transcription start site. Um, but uh, other sites can vary considerably. They may be conserved uh, when you compare a mouse and a human promoter, but they may have quite different distance because there may be some stretch of uh, poly A or whatever inserted in the one case, which does not have any obvious function. Uh, but um, when you have a closer look at the binding site in this its sequence itself and its immediate surrounding, then you will find that is conserved, but the distance is not necessarily conserved. Thank you very much. Uh, let's comment briefly on this uh, question, so complaints that Pathfinder tool does not work. So 
So first, uh, we need to comment how to, to make it working, right? So Volker, what uh, we, we should activate flash, right? Yes, uh, so, sorry, yeah. Yeah, the uh, Pathfinder, so the current Pathfinder, this is uh, based on flash. So you need to allow flash on your computer. And um, however, you know that uh, flash will be, uh, at, uh, yeah, uh, will, will only be active for a few months more. And uh, we are currently, um, yeah, working on a new version, which will be released soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And now, uh, interesting question. Can we look for transcription factor binding sites in gene in other species, like monkey or just human genes? We can, can look in any sequence, in any site, uh, and we could combine it with conservativity analysis. But uh, first of all, the applying the matrix library is can be reasonably done for any mammalian species when you select say all mammalian matrices uh, you can apply that library to monkey to uh, any to squirrel to bear or whatever you you may be interested in um, it's getting more complicated if you deal with a non-mammalian genome or gene sequence and apply then uh, say the the mammalian matrices you still may get something and uh, of course having just um, um, uh, bird matrices or so there will be will be very few uh, and also to add some people even got valuable and interesting information when they applied mammalian matrices to analyze plant genes <laughs> to, to my own very surprise but e even that can sometimes give you but of course uh, we have plant uh, transcription factors and related matrices as well in the library. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, and it is a question about gene isoform regulation, which is not a bit not clear. Is it about transcription factors isoform or regulation of particular isoforms? Uh, well, when we speak about transcription factor isoforms, um, of course, then you have to look whether these isoforms have all the important ingredients in place, DNA binding domain, transcription activating or repressing domain, and maybe regulatory domain, which activates or deactivates the whole transcription factor about ligand binding, phosphorylation or whatever. So uh, transcription factor isoforms may have quite different uh, regulatory functions. Not necessarily, you have to look exactly what um, these isoforms, in what aspect these isoforms are different. When it is about the regulated gene, well, uh, different splice forms, of course, are subject to the same uh, transcriptional regulation. But um, uh, when it is about alternative promoters, alternative transcription start sites, they may be indeed quite different in terms of their promoter uh, structure, trans constituting transcription factor binding sites and so on. And I think that's the reason why there are alternative promoters. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Edgar. I think with this we can close our uh, live Q&A session. And please feel free to send us further questions to support at genexplained.com and we will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Professor Wittgender. Thank you, Dr. Matis. Thank you Thank all you very much. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Have a nice evening. Have Goodbye. a nice evening. Bye.